Okay, well, it's really, really great to be here, and it makes a nice change because I go to an awful lot of conferences where I'm talking to doctors and other researchers uh, and, and actually patients and communities um, working on health, and that's all over the world. So I was in Zambia last week, I'm in Portugal later this week, you know. But this is great because you're rubbing shoulders with physicists and engineers and agricultural experts and goodness knows what. So I hope that's very enriching for all of us. Anyway, so I'm very, very pleased to be here. I am going to talk about health research. Um, and I don't have long to do it, so i better get on. So one thing I don't think we have talked very much about, actually, is conflict of interest, which is a hugely important part of transparency, ethics, responsibility, and certainly, whenever I speak, I always put up my conflicts of interest. You never know exactly which, which are going to be most relevant to the audience. I'll just let you read that, and you can decide whether you think any of that is relevant. Um, so I'll just let you read that. So one thing there is we have a tool in the toolkit, the RRI toolkit, which is this big e-learning program on how to do great research, great health research. And it's aimed largely at people in low-income countries, but actually it's being subscribed to in Edinburgh, in in Portugal, actually, in Mexico, all over the world. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about these things very quickly. Why medical research needs to open up, how open it can be, given that we're not talking about research on things, we're talking about research with people, and very often in the setting of a confidential discussion between a healthcare provider and a patient. That's often where research happens. So just how open can that be? And what can we all do, all of us, to try and make medical research more responsible and reproducible? Now, this is a European-based conference, so I just thought I'd have a quick look at what are the leading causes of death in Europe. Um, and the, these are recent data from the EU. Although it goes up to 2012, it takes a while to crunch these numbers. But there's lots of good news there, and you may have seen in the last 24 hours a report in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, which got a lot of press coverage, saying that rates of dementia are dropping off in the US, and that's echoing studies we already have from Europe and the UK. Uh, sure, there's still a lot of dementia around because our parents and so on are are, are, are suffering dementia now, and dementia won't go away, but it's happening at older ages. Um, so that's great. You think, hey, we're winning a lot of these uh, battles and addressing a lot of these challenges. However, there is, oops, sorry, this, which is a still a major challenge, which is inequality, and it's not just between countries, it's within countries. And of course, when you think of lower and middle income countries around the world, this challenge is even greater. And not only are those countries dealing with the problems of infectious disease, of mental health problems, of accidents, violence, road crashes, that sort of thing, they're also now dealing with those diseases I showed you on the last slide. Increasingly, people in countries like India are facing a massive wave of diabetes, high, high blood pressure, and so on. So we are really still tackling an awful lot of challenges, and how are we best able to do that? Well, by asking the right research questions is a great place to start, but I don't know about your field. There is a crazy, mad, pernicious focus on results. And if you focus on results of research and you look for highly significant results, then that's actually meaningless because what you're doing is you're encouraging people to discard the results that they don't like, to discard the research that may be inconclusive or the research that says, do you know what? There is no association between this and that. And this thing we tried, it didn't work. Now, those studies are often more important than the ones that say, hey, this is all fabulous and wonderful and I've got this new thing that goes bing and it's going to make everybody better. Those studies are often not much use, actually. And not only is it bad to focus on results being terribly positive, it's actually dangerous. It leads to scientific fraud. It leads to people not being honest in the research that they want to share and publish. But back to the questions, because this is where it really all goes wrong, is we're just not ask, asking the right questions in the first place. And what I've got here is a slightly complicated graph. It comes from a great body called the James Lind Alliance. James Lind was the guy who arguably did the world's first randomized controlled trial when he got British sailors to eat citrus fruit 
to keep their health in shape. And it was limes, uh, limes, and they actually prevented scurvy. But he randomly allocated the fruit to the sailors. And that was arguably the first trial ever. Anyway, this is an alliance that brings together patients and the public and researchers and clinicians to work out what are the priorities for health research. And it's an international endeavor. This graph looks at, on the right-hand side, the questions that are asked, not surprisingly, by companies, by big pharma and uh, companies that make medical devices and so on. And the blue is drugs, vaccines, biologicals. And not surprisingly, companies are interested in products. Fair enough, I guess. The red is interventions in trials such as radiotherapy, surgery, uh, devices and diagnostics. And then the little green bit is actually living with the disease, actually coping with illness. So when you come on to academic trials done in universities, of which there are very, very many, far more than there are industry trials, most medical research is done by academics and clinicians in universities and medical schools around the world. It's a bit more even there. But when you ask patients over on the left-hand side what they want to know, Sure, they're quite interested in new treatments, but they are far more interested in living with a disease. A classic example was from the uh, former head of the European uh, Association for Parkinson's Disease, where she said, doctors looking at Parkinson's disease are interested in the neck up. Patients are interested in the waist down. Can I walk? Can I have sex? Can I pee? Those sorts of questions. That's what patients care about. And they want help with that. Now, this is the most important slide. It's uh, from a group of researchers who published a great series in the Lancet Medical Journal in 2014. And they showed that research is starting in the wrong place, and all the way through the research endeavor, we are wasting the efforts. And they calculated that things going wrong at each of these stages amounted to 85% of health research around the world being wasted in one way or another, amounting to $100 billion of wasted research funding every single year, which sounds dramatic, but they carefully went through it and used estimates such as research grants that had to be, well, were wasted because the results um, of the studies were unsafe in some way. The papers had to be retracted because of fraud, that kind of thing. And over there on the left, what we need are research questions that are relevant to society, to patients, to people using research. And we need to make sure that research funders and people setting research priorities actually consult with, and not just consult with, but genuinely listen to and involve society and patients. And there are some organizations doing this. The National Institutes of Health Research in the UK is very unlikely to fund a research project to give a grant unless the researchers can show that they truly involve patients and the public in developing the research questions and the study design. And PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute in the US, which was one of the Obama initiatives, um, is doing the same. But then there are massive problems with using the wrong methods or suboptimal methods to answer the question. Then there are all sorts of glitches, and worse than glitches, really. There are perverse incentives in the regulation of research and the way it gets delivered. There are real problems with people not being um, open and publishing all of their results, sharing everything, even the studies they don't like. And then there are problems with the papers that are published not being clear enough and not giving enough method methodological detail. I'm not looking at you. You've got the timing, haven't you? <laughs> You'll have to come stand in front of me. Maybe I should look this way. Here's one example. So some of you remember that drug, Ozoltamivir, known as Tamiflu? Yeah. It was stockpiled, certainly where I live, in Oxford Town Hall. My medical student neighbour was sent to Oxford Town Hall to give out Tamiflu like... M&Ms, like, like candy, to anybody who came in saying, I think I've got flu. Because uh, everyone panicked and said, oh, we don't want them going to see the doctor because they might kill everybody in the waiting room. So this drug was stockpiled, and one country alone, the UK Department of Health, spent £424 million on stockpiling this drug for swine flu and yeah, then chucked I mean, away so, yeah. 6.5 million units yeah. of it because they were never used, they went out of date. It was worth £74 million. And the problem is that the drug trials done by the companies for this drug and a sister drug 
were never fully reported. They were done back in the 1990s. They were done mainly to see if these drugs might eventually be over the counter for a way to get back to work or school a bit quicker when you've got flu. And indeed, those drugs are good at that. They, they shorten flu by about half a day, which on a population basis is quite a big deal. However, they did not show that those drugs prevented really nasty flu complications, particularly pneumonia. That's not what those trials showed. But none of us knew that at the time. WHO didn't know that. Governments didn't know that. We, we were all told these drugs will save lives. You know, come and buy them now, roll up. But then eventually this uh, organization called the Cochrane Collaboration, which does very careful syntheses of research, eventually got from the companies the actual raw data from the studies, and this is what they found. I hope by now you've read that. So the drugs are okay, they're quite useful, they are not life-saving. And that's because we didn't have the full picture, we didn't have fully transparent research with access to the raw data. So data sharing from trials is a big deal, and many organizations are calling for it. This is the US Institute of Medicine, which put out a very influential report in 2015 saying that this is something we've just got to do. It's not easy, not least, because what you're saying to patients is, come and be in this trial. You're going to randomly get this treatment or that treatment or nothing, because we genuinely don't know which one's best. People are going to publish the results, and by the, way, by the way, they're going to put the actual raw data somewhere where other researchers can look at them. Is that all right with you? Well, actually, it is all right if it doesn't have all sorts of things like your name, address, your sexual history, all sorts of stuff that you wouldn't want people to know. And there are now smart ways to de-identify these data sets. And increasingly, there's not a suggestion about putting them in the public domain, but putting them in platforms where other researchers can re request access when they have a decent study proposal. And many other bodies are asking for this. So the UN just put out a statement on data sharing from trials. WHO has done so. And many journals are now um, insisting that data are fully made available from trials. And this is all part of what we call open science. And that's a bit small. But there are many benefits of open science, which I hope many of you know about. And open science does mean openness to questions and, importantly, methods. We're not just talking about results and data because we don't understand those if we don't know how they were generated. So for work to be truly reproducible and understandable and usable, you actually need great detail of study methods. Anyway, there are lots of advantages to this. And under Horizon 2020, there's a big push towards open access and open science, but with the caveat that it should be as open as possible and as closed as necessary when it's needed to protect people's confidentiality and privacy. And that's one of the challenges for all of us in society, how we do that. Just, this is almost my last slide. How am I doing? Two minutes. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, just to say, people talk about data, but actually we're talking about different things in health research. So we have data from studies, which is what I've just been talking about. You know, researchers do a study and they generate a data set. But then there are data from routine clinical care, from the medical records. Now, if you're in Tanzania, actually increasingly they are electronic records, but they might not be, they might be handwritten. They're still medical records and they're still a potential, uh, very useful resource for research. If you're in the Netherlands or the UK, they're, they're going to be electronic records. And increasingly, it's clear that the, this is a fantastic resource for real life research rather than the artificial conditions of clinical trials. But then there's also big data research. And that's all the stuff like biobanks and registries of people with a particular disease and population stats and all of that. Now, all of these data sets are potentially shareable, reusable, with responsible innovation, but there are many, many questions for all of us. And we just don't know. We don't know if you or you or you would actually say, cool, you know, actually I'm going to be cross if you don't make my data available to other researchers, or you're going to go, oh, no, I don't mind being in your study, but I don't want my data shared with other people without you coming back and asking me every time. We actually don't know because people are not doing enough of those studies. So there's a lot we need to do, but we need to do it because if we want to tackle the challenges of health 
here and all around the world, we need to really understand what people want from research, what questions need answering, and once they've been answered, what they actually found. So, questions for all of us. What can we all do as patients, the public, those of you who are academics, I don't know if any of you are working in health research or funding, but even if these things are not up your street, I would argue that as citizens, you ought to be thinking about these things and taking part in consultations when you get the chance. One last thing, publishers can do stuff, I know I'm out of time, but just to say, sorry, it's a quick plug really, because the journal I work at, the British Medical Journal, has for many years now had a patient advisory group, which is international. We have a, a, a full-time patient liaison editor, a, a part-time patient editor. A lot of our content is co-produced by patients and um, experts. We include patients in our peer review process for our research papers and we have a patient advisor on our editorial committee where we decide which research to publish. And we're finding that incredibly useful and illuminating and it's really helping us to select and publish the research which genuinely can change medicine and benefit society. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.